everyone for coming and um, we wish to acknowledge the land on which the Faith Institute operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Uran Wedat and the Seneca and the Mississauga of the Credits. Today, this meeting place is the home of uh, is the home to many indigenous people from across Soto Highland, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. And today we welcome Professor Abba Gomer, who is a professor of mathematics at the School of Mathematical and Statistical Science in Arizona State University. He received his PhD in mathematics from Brunei University, England in 1994. That was a long time. And was a professor of mathematics at the University of Manitoba in Canada from 1999 to 2014. Professor Gomer uh, research works uh, in the fields of applied non-linear dynamical systems, mathematical biology, and computational mathematics. His work is primarily focused on the use of mathematical approaches to gain insight into the transmission dynamics and control of um, emerging and re-emerging diseases of, of public health importance. His recent work addresses the problem of the effects of changes in climatic variables, such as rainfall, um, temperature, and so on, on the ecology and epidemiology of vector borne diseases. He has co authored um, several peer review research papers and three edited books. And um, Professor Gomez has received numerous research awards and honors and is actively involved in numerous um, in science and technology capacity building effort in the continent of Africa. He will give his talk titled Mathematics of Malariology, the Renewed Quest for Eradication. You're welcome to present. Excellent. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can share the, the screen. Sure. Okay. Are you able to see? Yes, you can see. Okay, now how do I make it full view? Let's see. Screen. Excellent. Yeah, perfect. All right. Uh, let me... Okay. Okay, so uh, I'll get started. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. David, for the very kind uh, introduction and for the invitation to, to speak. Uh, uh, York and Phil's Institute are home to me. I worked at uh, the Phil's Institute as postdoc. 98, 99, and also had a chance to teach a course or two at York University. So it's very much uh, uh, home. Um, so the title, the lecture is on mathematics of uh, malariology, the quest for uh, eradication. And uh, okay, yeah. Um, so, but before going into to that part, I'd like to acknowledge some of the sponsoring agencies that support our work, including the uh, NSF Science Foundation, and also through my affiliation with the University of Pretoria in South Africa, I also have uh, support from the National Research Foundation of South Africa and the MSRI and so on. And this talk, I would like to dedicate it to uh, uh, a colleague, uh, Professor Fred Brower, who passed away last year, in the last year. Uh, Fred was a great mentor, a great scholar, a great leader of math bio biology in Canada. Um, a rock solid pillar for support and fatherly figure to, to many of us. So I think his giant presence will be missed. So uh, I'd like to dedicate this lecture. But I, I'll get myself in trouble because if Fred was here, he's going to get upset with me because uh, some of the, he, he, we have what is called the Fred principle. Okay, so to him, a model cannot exceed more than two state variables. You cannot have more than two equations in, in the model. Okay, that, that violates. If you have three or more equations, it violates the Fred principle. So he was, oh, that's too complicated. Let's do it simple one. Anyway, but uh, I'd like to dedicate the lecture to, to Fred. Okay. And also, I want to acknowledge uh, um, my, some of my collaborators, particularly uh, my students here on top. Uh, uh, Dr. Ivoy Inaharu finished his PhD, uh, now works in pharmaceutical company, and Pramansa Brozok is currently a PhD student. Uh, Kamaldin Okone is also graduated and working in the pharmaceutical company. He won the Bellman Prize uh, last year. And my colleague here, uh, Dr. Stephen Eikenberry, 
who did a lot of work of COVID and malaria. And Dr. Mohamed uh, Awal, uh, who's currently at uh, Morgan State University. And my two entomology collaborators, Dr. Sylvie Hyphen and Crime Pymans at the School of Life Sciences, they do all the experimental and field work related to mosquitoes uh, that I collaborate with. Uh, we have National Science Foundation funding to, to do this, this work. Okay, so uh, in vector borne diseases account for uh, at least 17% of infectious, of all infectious diseases of mankind, causing over 700,000 deaths each year. Okay, so they are, they are really of major concern. And among the vector borne diseases, the most important one is malaria, which causes about 219 cases globally, mostly in uh, tropical and subtropical tropical regions of the world, and killing over 400,000 people annually. It used to kill before 2000, before the advent of, before the large scale use of insecticides, it used to kill one to two million people globally. Okay, but now we've dramatically reduced the mortality to 400,000. Uh, due to the use of insecticide, which I'll talk about later on. Uh, dengue disease uh, is affecting over 4 billion people in about 129 countries, 96 million symptomatic cases annually, and over 40,000 people die of dengue yearly. Uh, there are other vector-borne diseases like chikungunya, Zika, uh, caused by the same mosquito that causes dengue, the uh, Aedes mosquito. And in Canada, of course, West Nile virus is very important here. It's also, also important here in the United States and other countries. Uh, we didn't have West Nile until the 90s, late 90s, in question into North America. Uh, and I would attribute that maybe to climate change and some other factors, but mostly climate change. And, and other, so, but the point I want to make is many of these uh, vector borne diseases are zoonosis. These are diseases that start from animal populations, circulated mostly in animal populations, that now mutate into forms that are transmissible. Uh, in human populations as well, or between humans through a bite of uh, a vector. So a vector-borne disease is a disease that's transmissible between humans, human to human, through the vector. So the vector has to bite the human and take the infection from the human and pass it on to the next human through a bite again. So that's the way it works. Uh, so that's now concerted efforts to eliminate malaria. And that's the reason why we really want to, to focus on malaria. Uh, in fact, as of 2020, but 20 countries have eliminated malaria. That's the distinction between elimination and eradication. So eradication is global, but elimination is local. So certain countries have eliminated malaria, like some countries like uh, Morocco, for example, in, in Northern Africa, I think Algeria also, uh, some parts of Europe. Um, I think China also last year was declared to have eliminated malaria. That's, WHO has this metric for determining whether or not a country has eliminated malaria. So there is now a concerted global effort to eradicate the disease. Uh, because it's killing of, of the uh, malaria, of the, of the 400,000 people that are dying each year, majority are children under the age of five, and nobody wants to see that, you know, over 70, 80% of mortality is in children under five. So that's a huge effort now to el eliminate or eradicate malaria by 2030 or zero by 2040. And, and, that's, and there are certain impediments, there are certain problems that get in the way of this eradication effort, and these are some of the things I want to talk about today. Okay. So are we to blame that we have all these diseases, uh, vector-borne diseases, like West Nile, like malaria, like dengue, that are causing a lot of burden globally? Uh, and, and the answer is, uh, is yes, we as humans, we, we are to blame because most of what uh, is respons we're responsible for most of uh, the situations that leads to breeding habitat for many of these diseases. So the emergence and re-emergence of these diseases is greatly influenced by human action. So by passage in host environment interactions. So this is the one health philosophy okay, that some researchers in Canada and globally are talking about now. You know, in order for us really to improve human health, we need to pay attention to animal health, we need to pay attention to environmental health. And I think this is nicely captured by the emergence or re-emergence of uh, vector-borne diseases like malaria, dengue, Zika, chikungunya, and Chagas disease, and so on. Okay, so human action, climatic and non-climatic factors, right? So human action that affect the climate in which we live. So changes in temperature, precipitation, humidity, humidity um, global warming, and so on. But there are also non-climatic factors that provide breeding ground for many of these diseases, such as land use changes. Okay, so now because of urban, rural urban migration, we have to clear forests, we have to clear land to build hospitals, to build schools, to build houses, and so on. And that creates breeding habitats for mosquito-borne diseases and vector-borne diseases. Agricultural practices, migration, and uh, antimicrobial uh, drug use, and so on. Wildlife trade, as we have seen now with respect to COVID-19, for example, livestock keeping, 
these are all um, actions, human actions that make us as humans vulnerable to diseases that are circulating in the wild in animal populations. Okay, so I think to some extent, to a large extent, we are to blame for many of these diseases because of our actions, anthropogenic actions, anthropogenic climate change and non-climate change as well. Anyway, so we'll talk about malaria. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a parasitic disease caused, caused by this uh, uh, parasite plasmodium, and there are uh, five main species. Falciparum and Vivax are the dominant ones that cause majority of the mortality, over 90% due to, uh, uh, the, uh, well, almost all of them. Uh, the two of them are responsible for almost all of the mortality, uh, 90%, over 90% due to falciparum alone, which is predominant in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so the Nolaisia was recently discovered in the Borneo Island in, in Southeast Asia, and it's, 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 uh, it's common in nature and macaques uh, in Southeast So sometimes people call that zoonotic malaria. So it's malaria in, 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 in this uh, species. But anyway, uh, so that's, that's the, the cause. And there are so many vectors for malaria, over 450 different species of Anopheles mosquitoes. Uh, can vector malaria, but only 41 are major vectors. So to be a major vector, to be able to transmit malaria to humans, uh, this Anopheles species has to be able to first habitually bite humans, second, live long enough to complete the supergonic cycle that I will talk about uh, later on. And third is to be able to have a, a plasmodium, so to carry plasmodium. Majority of these uh, species will not do all of these three uh, situations as needed to become a major vector. So that's why we only have like 41 that are efficient vectors for malaria in humans. The rest, they bite non-human primates, for example, they bite animals or other, other species. And the dominant vectors in Sub-Saharan Africa is uh, Anopheles gambiae, okay? And it's the, the target for most of the modeling efforts is most people are studying gambiae because it's the dominant one. And it has very high vectorial capacity. That's why it's causing a lot of cases. Uh, and it's, it's associated with conditions that are related to anthropogenic alteration of the environment, as I mentioned. Man-made alteration of the environment, such as deforestation, construction, agriculture, human settlements, livestock use, and so on. Okay, so it, this species thrives in situations where the land is altered, where the environment is altered by humans through all of these actions. Okay, yeah, so I mentioned that. And this is, it. so this is why we had, we have forests, we had a clear forest for agricultural purposes, for, large, uh, for building hospitals, schools, and homes, and so on. And this creates all the breeding habitats for uh, mosquitoes to thrive, for example. And the same here. Yeah, so that's this nice quote from uh, Frank Livingston. It's only when man cuts down the forest that breeding places for Anopheles Gambia become almost infinite. That's a cute uh, quotation. Anyway, so back to the parasite. Uh, they are, this, the parasite may have evolved some 130 million years ago. It's called ancient malaria, infected mostly non human primates like lizards and some other, yeah, uh, mammalian primates, not humans. Uh, it may have crossed over to humans some 12,000 years ago. This is uh, the, at the end of the era of the, uh, the, the global warming era, starting the last ice age leading to this. Uh, because of stable and warmer global temperatures. So 12,000 years ago, the, the, the Earth really uh, warmed up uh, significantly, you know, allowing for agricultural, well, the advent of agricultural civilization around that time. And that's when uh, temperature starts to become conducive for this kind of uh, parasites and mosquitoes to, to survive. So land use changes, concentration of human settlement, agricultural civilization, uh, provided the breeding habitats or breeding grounds for malaria mosquitoes and the falciparum, uh, which crossed over to humans some 12,000 years ago. Before 12,000 years ago, we didn't really have human malaria. We, we have malaria in other species, but not in humans. Again, this is related to human action. Things we are doing to the environment, climate change, anthropogenic climate change leading to uh, the era of global warming, uh, which allows for agricultural uh, civilization, which then again, we have to, for agricultural civilization uh, to, to practice agriculture, you have to clear land. By destabilizing land, of course, you're providing breeding habitats for mosquitoes to thrive. So Plasmodium was discovered by a French army officer in Algeria uh, uh, in 1880, and Sarona Rose uh, completed the, elucidated the full life cycle 
of uh, plasmodium in birds in 1897 and in humans in uh, 1899 in Sierra Leone. He won the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1902, but we know Saronoros not just because of the, uh, the life cycle of plasmodium, but for laying the foundation for the threshold theory of epidemics. Okay, I'm going to talk about his model later on. You wouldn't have to kill almost tutors to effectively control malaria in, in, in Western Europe, for example. All you need to do is bring the mosquito population below a certain threshold, and that's it. That's all that's needed. So it leads to concepts like R naught, right? You don't have to bring R naught less than one. You don't have to make it zero. Just bring it less than one, you have a chance to control the disease. Okay, so the life cycle of the adult female mosquito. So the way to get malaria is you have to be bitten by adult female mosquito. Okay, um, to, to, to take blood meal from humans. It, it, it needs the blood meal basically because adult female mosquito wants to be a, a good mother because it wants to, to feed its eggs. Okay, the, the, the protein in our blood is used in the process of development and the maturation of eggs. Okay, so it taking blood meal from us. If the mosquito is infected, it could inject the plasmodium into the human. The human becomes infected with some probability. Or if the human is infected but the mosquito is not, and the process of taking the blood meals of the mosquito can get infected as well. So that's the way it works. So the disease is transmitted between humans through the bite of adult female uh, anopheles mosquito in search of uh, uh, blood meal from humans. Okay, so eggs are laid by adult female mosquitoes. Uh, Gambia may lay 10 to about 150 eggs each time uh, during gonotropic cycle, which I'll talk about later on. This is the blood uh, searching or questing cycle. Um, the eggs will hatch into larvae within two to three days in normal temperatures, but in colder climates, it could take two to three weeks or even longer. Uh, the larvae become poopy in about four to 10 days typically, and then they become forced into adults in two to four days. So that's, and the adult uh, life cycle of the adult Anopheles mosquito is governed by the gonotropic cycle, which is basically, again, host seeking cycle, right? So when adult female mosquito pops out, the first order of business typically is to look for a human host to take blood meal from. Once it succeeds, it goes to the next stage where it rests on the wall somewhere for the process of development and maturation of the eggs. That's stage two. And then the stage three is to find a breeding habitat to lay the eggs. So this picture here, and these are all highly, highly temperature dependent. Both the vector and the parasite plasmodium are very much, the life cycles are very much temperature dependent. So this is typically what happens. So this adult human mosquito here pops out Okay, uh, it looks for a human host to bite. If it succeeds, then it go, this, is, this is stage one of the gonotropic cycle. So if it succeeds in getting the blood meal from the human, it goes to stage two, which is to rest and, um, on the wall somewhere for the eggs to develop and to mature. If it succeeds in surviving the stage two, it goes to stage three of the gonotropic cycle, which is to find the breeding habitat, which is the body of water to lay the eggs. So here the eggs are laid and they're laid on the surface of the water and then they go into the uh, hatch into larvae and the larvae has these four inside stages based on their sizes. The larvae are sitting inside the water. They're feeding off algae and other uh, uh, resources or nutrients in, in the water to, so that the sizes are increasing as they get more, more food, more resources and they become poofy and then poofy become and the cycle continues. So typically adult female mosquito may undergo a tropic cycle like three, four times uh, during its life cycle. So this is typically what, what happens with, with malaria for the life cycle. Uh, so, so, yeah. And so let's go back to the early control of malaria. Okay, uh, this is the work of Sarono Rose. The simplest possible model for malaria disease was uh, constructed or was developed by Sarono Rose. Again, he's a British surgeon uh, who did great work in, 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 in India and also in Sierra Leone and he's back in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, so the total human population is H of T, mosquito population is M of T, and X is infected humans, and Z of T is infected mosquitoes. And now you convert into proportions, so the little X is proportion of infected humans, and uh, little Z of T is infected, uh, proportion of infected mosquitoes. So M is the host vector ratio, so the number of mosquitoes per person per, per unit time. So that this parameter is very important, yeah. Okay, and A is the mosquito bite rate per capita bite rate. Okay, and B is the probability that a human can get infected following a bite from an infectious mosquito, and C is the probability the other way around that a mosquito can, a susceptible mosquito can get inf infected by biting infectious human. And R is the recovery rate, and mu is the death rate of uh, the mosquito. 
So this is the rate of change of the infected human population. So, it's a so X is the rate of change of the infected. So the model just has infected humans and infected mosquitoes. And also susceptible humans. The susceptible humans is H minus X, right? So if X is infected, H is total human, H minus X is those humans that are susceptible. And then Z is the proportion of mosquitoes that are infectious. And M is the host vector ratio. So MA is the number of bites that a human receives. And the B is the probability that that bite from infectious mosquito will lead to infection. So this is the number of new infections, essentially. And, and so minus R, so this is the, the recovery rate of humans. So this human infected human can recover from this. Uh, similarly, the equation for infected uh, mosquitoes is you know, given by this. So M minus Z is uh, uh, susceptible mosquitoes. They get, they bite infectious human X, and this C is the probability that this bite will lead to infection, and A is the bite rate. And one over mu is the average lifespan of the adult mosquito. So there's no immature mosquito, as you notice from the uh, uh, um, flow diagram I showed before, or the life cycle of the adult mosquito, you have the immature dynamics, egg, larvae, pupae, and so on. But the uh, uh, Saronorosis model is, is really simple, but it, it was so compelling uh, in, in its conclusion. But this, I should go back to my earlier joke, this will satisfy the Fred principle because it has only two equations. Okay, so if Fred was here, he will laugh, he will approve this. He will say, yeah, very good. Okay, so we can calculate the reproduction number for this simple model uh, by inspection. Maybe this is the reproduction number from human to vector times that of vector to human. So this is the human to vector. So AC divided by R. So mosquitoes uh, transmitting um, uh, infectious mosquitoes, trans uh, 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 susceptible mosquitoes biting human. So infectious human transmit the disease to a mosquito. And this is how long the human lives, one over R, its average duration before recovery. Okay, so under the same thing from the uh, vector to human. Anyway, that's the, so M is in blue because that's the, the parameter that's most important. Sarono Rose says, okay, just in order for us to effectively control malaria, we need to focus on reducing M. So R0 is the average number of new cases generated by one infectious mosquito in the human population or one infectious human in the mosquito population. Okay, so if you make it less than one, of course, then you, you have the chance to control the disease. So how do you minimize R0? So minimize whatever. It's in the numerator, M is dominant here. So reduce the host vector ratio. How many mosquitoes per person per unit? So that's what Saron Oro says, okay? Reduce M and that lays the foundation for habitat destruction. To reduce M, to reduce the number of mosquitoes, essentially we reduce the breeding habitat for mosquitoes, okay? But notice this model doesn't have some progonic cycle. So once a mosquito is infected, this mosquito is instantaneously capable of transmitting to a human. Okay, and there's also no schizogonic cycle. When a hu human is infected, this human is instantaneously capable of transmitting to a susceptible mosquito. So that's the underlying assumption. But the schizogonic cycle is like 98 days. When a mosquito gets infected by taking a blood milk from myself, for example, if I'm infected with malaria, that mosquito is not ready for prime time. It's not able to transmit to the next human until after about 9 to 18 days, right, of schizogonic cycle. Okay. So that's a latency free rate before the mosquito becomes infectious. That's the same thing in humans. Once a human is infected with malaria, it, if it gets a bite from a mosquito, it doesn't, the mosquito may not get infected until uh, the human satisfy or sat, uh, survives this shizagonic cycle, which is typically six to 15 days. And this model also has a homogeneous mixing assumption. Mosquitoes are equally likely to mix with humans or humans and exponentially distributed waiting time in each compartment. Okay, so this is a simplifying assumption for more, uh, compartmental model, which I will also use later on. But anyway, uh, this led to the first scientific control efforts against malaria, focusing on destroyed larval habitats. Okay, and this, that's a cl the classical paper uh, here below. You can take a the reference if you. And but then, George MacDonald came along in the 1950s, and all he did was essentially uh, modify the model slightly by just adding this time delay to capture this progonic cycle. That when a mosquito is infected, it's not instantaneously infectious. It's not able to transmit the infection to a human until after surviving this progonic cycle. And this is this probability of surviving that cycle exponential of minus mu tau. Tau is the time delay, mu is the natural um, uh, lifespan, one of my mu is lifespan. Okay. So, and that's the only distinction or the only change, the modification to the Saronorosis model. And I'm glad uh, that uh, 
Jack Blair is here, of course, we're talking time delay models. He's, he's the expert. If you have any questions, he'll answer them. Sorry, Jack. Anyway, the R0 is similar to only that now we have exponential of minus mu tau. And what Sarunaro says, sorry, it's a Judge McDonald says, focus on this problem. Therefore, ignore habitat destruction, essentially, allow mosquitoes to become adult mosquitoes, but kill them before they survive this progonic cycle. Get rid of them. So minimize this, 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 this term, basically. And that laid the foundation for targeting adult mosquitoes rather than immature mosquitoes, which was what Sarona Rose, is, Sarona Rose suggested. OK? So this is really compelling. By just small change to the model, it led to a big shift in the approach, global approach to control the malaria, uh, malaria disease. It now focusing on adult. And this is what's even happening today, based on McDonald's extension of uh, Sarona Rose's work. Just adding time delay changed the entire uh, mechanism, uh, control mechanism for the disease. The mindset for control is now targeting adult mosquitoes rather than immature mosquitoes. Yeah, so and then DDT was uh, synthesized in 1939 by Paul Muir, a, a Swiss uh, chemist. He got the Nobel Prize in medicine in 1948. This was uh, DDT was deployed during the Second World War. Uh, and it was observed to have this long lasting residual effect. So if you spray it, it still, its effect is still felt in the environment for, 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 for weeks and sometimes even months. So that was very handy to know in the 1950s. Um, and DDT was also used as pesticides in agriculture. So there's huge amount of uh, use of DDT, both in vector control and also in agriculture. So that naturally, and of course, the kids are uh, sprayed with DDT on the beach, they protect your children against disease, carrying insects, so use DDT everywhere, so quite popular. Uh, anyway, so th that prompted another call for eradication of malaria uh, in the 1950s to not, up until about 1960, motivated by McDonald's work. Uh, okay, so IRS indoor residual spray, which means you go and spray uh, uh, in, in those when the mosquitoes are in the second stage of the gonotrophic cycle, when they've taken a blood meal and they are resting on the wall, that's when they are defenseless. You try to kill them using these insecticides. Uh, a lot of success, mostly in Europe, not much success uh, um, uh, in Africa, but in Europe, in the Americas, and also parts of Asia at the time. But resistance to DDT becomes a big problem, and the whole eradication effort had to be disbanded in the 1960s. There are also logistical issues. And, and so on. But widespread use of these insecticides in vector control and agriculture resulted in uh, the mosquitoes selecting to be resistant, to selecting for resistance to DDT. And at the time, that was the best we had uh, to control mosquitoes. So they had to just ban eradication effort. OK, but now uh, between 2000 and 2015, also a great success was recorded. I told you earlier on that we used to suffer like 1 to 2 million deaths each year due to malaria globally. Uh, between 2000 and 2015, a large scale use of insecticide based interventions, IRS, indoor residual spray, and the use of bed nets resulted in a dramatic reduction in incidence and uh, mortality of malaria in endemic areas. Okay, although other factors were responsible, uh, were also um, contributed to the success, uh, such as uh, improved drug therapy and improved diagnosis or early diagnosis and uh, drug therapy like using atomicin in bed therapy and public health infrastructure have been improved. Uh, that's also played some role, but the main mechanism that really resulted to this extraordinary uh, decrease in, in malaria incidence and mortality during the year 2000, 2015 is attributed to the use of insecticides in endemic areas, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. So, and the dominant mechanism is this long lasting insecticidalness, which I'll talk about later. And there are five main classes of uh, this net but I focus more on pyrethroid because it's the only one that is approved for use in this long lasting insecticidal nets. And this, this, this are the nets, okay? Uh, this is an example. Um, okay, well, what, upon, uh, upon contact, mosquito get killed by the net because of the killing efficacy of the net or is deterred by the net, okay? So from getting into the human that's sleeping inside the net. So a net has two main efficacies, the killing efficacy and the deterrence efficacy to push the mosquito away from the human. Okay. Yes, yeah, so the, the, but 
I think 1.5 billion of this bed net, particularly the long lasting insecticide, were distributed in endemic areas between 2000 and 2015, and that really resulted in a dramatic reduction in malaria burden. But then their large scale use also resulted in anopheles selecting for resistance to, to, to pyrethroid and all the other chemicals that are embedded in IRS, the Indian student spread. Okay, so the resist resistance ability to tolerate this uh, doses of insecticide. So the insecticide, basically the toxic material that are embedded in this net, okay, and this uh, IRS uh, chemical that I use. So if the mosquito is able to withstand that, then the mosquito is said to be resistant. But if it's not, if it's lethal, if it kills the mosquito, then the mosquito is sensitive to the insecticide. And there are two main mechanisms for insecticide resistance. Uh, one is the knockdown resistance KTR, KTR mutation which basically affect the nervous system of the mosquito and essentially leading to its death. So because of time, I'm not going to explain this in detail. And the other one is the affecting the metabolic pathway. So to inhibit the mosquito from designing through some, the use of some enzymes that allows it to break down these um, toxics uh, that are embedded in bedness and so on so that the mosquito becomes resistant, okay? So those are the two main pathways uh, for insecticide resistance in adult female mosquitoes. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, this I've already mentioned. Anyway, so the conventional bed nets are called ITNs, in, uh, insecticide treated nets. They are just deep inside this insecticide bath and they lose efficacy after several wash. So they're not really highly effective. So they have to be retreated. So you have to immerse them in this bath that contains the toxin or toxic material every six to 12 months. You have to keep doing that. But the long lasting insecticidal nets are more effective. They last, uh, they withstand many washes. They can last about three years. Uh, so 20 washes, this is by WHO standard. And there are even advanced versions of this LLINS, which uh, the, you may uh, you treat them with this PBOs uh, that inhibit this metabolism of pyrethroid that I mentioned earlier on. And you can also use adjuvant that decreases mosquito uh, fecundity, so to, to reduce the uh, number of eggs laid or number of offspring produced afterwards. Anyway, so the dramatic reduction was due to the use of insecticides, mostly long lasting insecticidal nets and IRS. But, and that result resulted in about 81% decrease in actually the number of uh, uh, malaria cases and mortality um, in, the, in, the, in the year uh, 2000. Okay, so in 2015, uh, we compared the the data was the data of 2000, you see that about 80 percent reduction. And of the 80 percent, 68 is 68 percent is due to the use of long lasting satellites. So the main mechanism for the control of malaria is really the use of this super duper bed net that are highly, highly effective. Okay, and then preventive measures uh, for eradication of malaria is uh, basically vector control that I mentioned, LNINS and uh, IRS and fossil protection against mosquito uh, bite. And there's also now an effort to design an effective vaccine against malaria. That's also the therapeutic measures. We have a really good drug that's been used to treat malaria. Uh, this uh, atomicinin combination therapy discovered by the sci uh, Chinese scientist, Dr. Tu Yu Yu in 1972, won the Nobel Prize in 2015. Anyway, so the main focus is this insecticide-based intervention. I, I mentioned before, 20 countries, including China, have eliminated malaria. Uh, there are many other countries that are trying now, in, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, to also eliminate malaria. So there's this sustainable development goals of getting rid of malaria globally by 2030, and there's the zero by 2040 initiative to also get rid of malaria. Okay, then the main stumbling blocks for eradication is, as I mentioned, is the resistance to all the currently available uh, insecticides used in RS and long-lasting insecticidal nets. Uh, anthropogenic climate change, Climate change is now making mosquitoes to thrive in places that they were not able to thrive before because the, the location or the environment is getting warmer and warmer and more conducive for them to thrive. thrive. So climate change is leading to a shift and expansion of malaria vectors to, 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 to new places. And parasite resistance to drug therapy, there's evidence also from Southeast Asia that atomicinin, uh, the, the, the plasmodium has developed resistance uh, to atomicinin in Cambodia and some other parts of Southeast Asia. And migration, more human, uh, mobility of both humans and vectors also, right? Human, urban, rural urban migration is also providing breeding ground for uh, malaria and land use changes. 
There's no safe and effective vaccine yet, but there are two very promising vaccines undergoing advanced stages of clinical trials, including an mRNA one with efficacy of about 70% in the target population, which is children under the age of five. So this is really, really highly promising. I suspect maybe by the end of this year, we may get FDA approval for a really good malaria vaccine, but it's not approved yet. Anyway, so we need to do some modeling to understand whether or not we can eradicate malaria using existing resources based on uh, the use of insecticides. That's really the, the objective. But malaria is a complex adaptive system in the sense that it has so many cycles. That's the immature aquatic cycle, like egg, live, food, food, adolescence. That's the gonotropic cycle I talked about, you know, the host seeking cycle. That's a schizogonic cycle, the parasite development or evolution inside the human. And the sapogonic cycle, also the maturation of the parasite inside the mosquito. Okay, so the parasite is so smart that it's able now to survive in two different hosts, in humans and in mosquitoes. So Plasmodium survives in both humans. So species that are able to do that, adapt to different hosts that they can survive in, uh, actually that is an evolutionarily stable strategy for, for survival. Very smart for Plasmodium to do that. So there are multiple species of Plasmodium, okay, and also multiple hosts, so the mosquito and humans, and also non-human primates. Plas Plasmodium can survive in non-humans. Primates, uh, primates as well. And so many different species of the vectors, as I mentioned, efficient one, about 41 species of Anopheles mosquitoes can transmit malaria to humans. So it's a multi-host, multi-vector, multi-parasite dynamic. So by definition, this is a complex system. So it's really difficult to model realistically because of all of these uh, components. So, and also the time scale, the time scale of the parasite in, in the mosquito and the human, you're talking about hours, maybe days, you know, but the, the time scale of the mosquito, the adult mosquito is also in weeks, like they survive to be like three weeks, four weeks. But the time scale of humans is in, in Canada, the average lifespan is like 80 years. Okay, so it has all the different time scales as well, which makes uh, the problem really uh, complicated. So in addition to all of that, you also have to couple all this with the population abundance of uh, ecology, the vector population genetics, because it, the resistance means you have to stratify the mosquito population according to uh, genotype, right? Those that are sensitive to, to insecticide, those that are not. Okay, and then the epidemiology of the disease in humans and mosquitoes, the parasite dynamics, the impact of climate change, human behavior in a response to interventions. Some people may choose to sleep under a bed net, some will not. You know, just like we've seen with COVID, some are accepting to be vaccinated, some are not, some are accepting to wear a mask, some are not. So it's Necessarily, we need some kind of genetic ecology, epidemiology, climatology kind of framework, you know, to really understand malaria. We have to incorporate all of these really important uh, uh, components, you know, to, to, the, to the jigsaw for malaria. Anyway, so modeling this complex adaptive system is inherently very complicated. Uh, it necessitates high dimensionality, which means you violate the freight principle because you're going to have to deal with large models. Nonlinearity and uh, it's uh, posing multiple um, challenges, both in terms of mathematical analysis, statistical analysis, uh, computational analysis as well. I mean, so it's all sort of complications. Okay, so what, one of the modeling objectives, and I'm not sure of timing, but I have to maybe run. Uh, uh, modeling um, objective. Sorry, go ahead. For the time, uh, we should leave about ten minutes for questions. Okay, so how much time do I have now? So you have about um, say 30 minutes. 12 minutes, 12 minutes. Oh, 12 minutes, okay, I'm just getting started. Okay, so link between insecticide resistance and malaria epidemiology. Okay, that's really the big question in ecology right now, malaria ecology for community. Okay, that's insecticide resistance, but does insecticide resistance make, uh, cause uh, more malaria cases or not? Nobody knows right now. So we're trying to understand that because the, to, to know that we need to know the fitness cost what's the impact of fitness cost of resistance, okay? So if the, fitness, if the mosquito is resistant to insecticide, okay, how does that affect its ability to produce offspring, ability to bite, ability to survive, to seek for a host, to find a mate to, 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 to met with, you know? So all of this fitness cost, and these are done in the lab to try to, and then we incorporate those into models to, to come up with better and more realistic uh, analysis of what's going on. Can eradication be achieved using existing resources? and impact of climate change and, and so on. Uh, and also the biological controls now, because of all this resistance to insecticides and to the drug therapy, uh, some are now advocating for biological controls, 
based on modifying the DNA of the mosquito. Okay, uh, so because of time, I, I may skip maybe some of this uh, because of time. Anyway, the simplest possible model we can come up with uh, captures the life cycle that I've shown before. Okay, so we are split the total mosquito population according to uh, as two main uh, cycles. Uh, the immature, so eggs, larvae, pupae, we have the four instar stages for the larvae, and the adult dynamics for the mosquito is SEI, susceptible, exposed, and infect infectious mosquitoes. And for the humans, we use SEIRS kind of formulation, but then some of the humans are protected, meaning they sleep under a bed net consistently uh, each night, okay? And some are not protected, okay? So we allow this human behavior component in the model. Okay, so this is typically the model. Okay, let me start from here. Uh, this is the, so X is the first stage of the gonotropic cycle is X, the host seeking, and Y is the second stage, the resting to develop X, and Z is the last stage, which is uh, laying the X, okay? Uh, on a bridge. So if, so if some mosquito, adult mosquito is here and X uh, uh, is susceptible and is in stage one of the gonotropic cycle, the host seeking rate is beta a, a BH, okay? So this mosquito is looking for a host. This host may be sleeping under a bed net, okay? Uh, this is the proportion of humans that are sleeping under a bed net is pi H, or may not be sleeping under a bed net, pi U. So pi H plus pi U is one. So if the human is sleeping under a bed net, that's probability when the mosquito encounters this human, it may die, it was probability epsilon die P, P for protected human, or it may get deterred, okay? So it's not able to penetrate the net and get to the human. So it comes back to the same X state, okay? And then try again. So, but if it succeeds in taking the blood meal, okay, then it goes to stage uh, two of the gonotropic cycle. Now it's susceptible if the mosquito, the human is not infected. But if the human is infected, it goes here, okay. And if so, in this stage two, the mosquito looks for uh, a breeding habitat. If he survives that, to go to stage three and then they lay eggs and then come back again and repeat the process. So that's the simple model. So red is infection and and and, and death following encounter with a uh, a host that's either protected or unprotected. Okay, so that's really the, 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 the model. And these are some of the parameters. Epsilon deter basically the probability of deterring the mosquito from getting to the human. Epsilon die is the probability that the mosquito dies following contact with a protected host or unprotected host and so on. Anyway, and we have three different types of nets. The weak ones that, you know, the probability of dying by contact with the protected host is, is low, 25%. But for the best one, it's about 90% chance of dying if you encounter a protected host. So there are different types of nets, uh, but uh, we classify them. Anyway, and this is the model uh, for the aquatic stage. So we have the mosquitoes that are laying eggs are the ones in the gonotropic cycle stage three, the one with the Z uh, subscript, susceptible, exposed, infectious in stage three. And this is the logistic uh, egg layer rate. And then they can mature to larvae, they mature from larvae stage one to stage two, three, and four, and then the poopy that then become adult mosquitoes and so on. And TA, TW, this is air temperature and water temperature. Uh, I wouldn't have time to go through that. These are the equations for mosquitoes in stage one and stage two, adult mosquitoes stage two, stage three. There are questions I can come back to. This. And these are the equations for humans, susceptible, exposed, infectious, recovered. Uh, P here means protected humans. These are humans that habitually sleep under a bed net today and so on, um, and these are the, um, so it, it's standard incidence formulation, so just to make sure. Um, the entomological inoculation rate is EIR, which is what ecologists tend to use to measure uh, uh, this malaria burden in, in populations, but um, anyway, so mathematical analysis, this is reproduction number for the uh, immature mosquitoes component. This is positive number, this here, this can show the denominator here is positive. And R naught is given by this is the is the square root of the R naught for uh, human to vector, but the human can be protected HP or unprotected times the R naught for from vector to human. And we have the square root because it takes two generations to come back to where it started. So from vector to human, back to vector. So so it says uh, and anyway, and we have the local asymptotic stability if R naught is less than one and. Uh, the disease-free equilibrium is unstable if it's greater than one. We have a backward verification if R0 is one. Uh, at R0 equals one, if the, the disease-induced mortality is uh, exceed a certain threshold. 
Uh, if it doesn't, then we can remove the backward verification and prove global supremacy. And this is why backward verification is. I can explain this later on. Due to time, I'll, I'll skip this. And uh, global stability in the absence of backward verification, which means Arnold Pledge one is necessary and sufficient for the elimination of malaria. Anyway, so we did some simulations using data for uh, malaria in endemic areas in, South, uh, in Eastern Africa. And we plotted here a fraction of individuals that are infected as a function of bed net coverage. And you see, and blue are uh, those that sleep under protected, uh, those, those that are protected, which means they sleep under a bed net. And red are those that do not sleep under a bed net. And the, pop, uh, the gold are the, is the average of the two or overall. Um, and you see that the fraction decreases as we increase the coverage of bed net 5P. And in order for us to eliminate the disease, we need about 90% of the population to be sleeping consistently under a bed net. That's what this simulation shows. And of course, the WHO suggested that, or the data from the WHO shows that uh, the best we can expect for coverage of bed nets in endemic areas is about 40 to 80%, 80% max. It's almost like 50% maximum, actually. And so we're not going to achieve, based on the parameterization, 90% coverage. It's just not feasible to do that, okay? And we, we have hollow endemicity and uh, um, hollow endemic areas. So we stratify the malaria areas in terms of whether or not they are hollow endemic, meaning they have transmission occurrence all year long with an R0 of about 14, or is meso endemic with an R0 of 4.3. It's a seasonal transmission. Uh, what we showed that we need 90% coverage needed for elimination. And, and here, this is a quantum plot up, up this uh, um, um, reparation number as a function of epsilon di p, the probability of death following encounter with a protected host, and the probability of, of uh, biting a protected host. And, and we see that what this figure actually shows that uh, high coverage of low, weakly effective net is much better than low coverage of highly effective bad net. This is what these simulations are actually showing. Uh, we better our view the low quality. It's just like with COVID, low quality face mask is as long as we get large coverage, uh, although that may not always be the case. But what this is saying is we better off use the low quality uh, bed nets as long as a lot of people sleep under them, uh, as against very few people sleeping under high quality bed nets. And we also check the effect of temperature. We see that uh, R node increases and reaches a peak around 30 degrees Celsius. So this is the maximum. This is one with the temperature corresponding to maximum abundance of mosquitoes and maximum malaria intensity. So we have more malaria as temperature increases uh, reaching the peak around 30 degrees, which means this is a time we should intensify control efforts. We should do more lava siding, adult siding, IRS, and so on as temperature gets closer and closer to about 30 degrees in this endemic area in uh, Eastern Kenya, Eastern Highlands of Kenya. And how does temperature affect uh, 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 malaria potential under different global warming scenarios. Okay, so this is a parasite rate in two to 10 year olds in, 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 in Africa taken in the year 2000. Okay, so red is bad news, blue is good news, and so on. This is what it does, and you see that it correlates nicely with R0. You know, parasite rate and R0. Okay, so what, do we, what we want to do is what happens to this malaria map or, or this R0 malaria map as we change. Uh, uh, temperature due to global warming, as global temperature increases due to warming. This is pre-long-lasting satellites, right? 2000. Remember 2000, 2015 was when we started uh, massive use of insecticide-based interventions. So this is pre-insecticide intervention, 2000. This is what's happening, and it correlates nicely with R0. So we plot R0 for all the countries, and we see that it's matching the data for parasite rate. So this is quite good to see. So we had to use some GIS. Uh, this is one of my collaborators actually did this coding for this. Okay, so what happens if global temperature changes, increases by 1.5 degrees based on this RCP scenario, okay, by 2030? If there's a 1.5 degree increase in global temperature, um, in average global temperature over the next, by the year 2030, over the next eight, eight or so years. And what we see, again, red is bad news. What we're seeing now is a shift towards from Western and Central Africa, more towards South, uh, Southern and Eastern Africa, under the scenario. This is what we're projecting. Climate change will shift the burden of malaria in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa from currently Central and Western Africa, more towards Eastern 
and Western Africa. We already started seeing a big change in Eastern Africa uh, in, 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 in Malaria due to global warming. So if we plot the map for uh, Eastern Africa alone, uh, you see that under the 1.5 uh, degree projection, this is what is happening. Uh, this is under the baseline scenario, 1.5 degree, you see more reds happening compared to the left side. If it's four degree increase, it's even more red, more devastation in Eastern Africa. Eastern Africa is cooler than Central and Western Africa. So as temperature increases due to warming the malaria, mosquitoes tend to be more abundant in that situation. Okay, so that's another thing. I think I'll skip this. This is the genetic epidemiology uh, framework. So here we split the malaria, uh, the mosquito population according to genotypes, uh, and we allow for random mating. Uh, so eggs, live, so SS is SS genotype, they're sensitive to insecticide. RS, these are the heterozygous ones. So they have, so uh, resistance, insecticide resistance is determined by a single gene with two alleles, okay? The resistant one R and the sensitive one S. And then we have the homozygous resistant ERR and so on. So this mature into adult mosquitoes and they mate randomly and you have this, all this probability, all this mating outcomes and then what they produce. So the X in this case will all be ESS, ERS and so on. So it's really a straightforward way to allow for random mating and hiding Weinberg condition. And this is the model uh, that we, the, the reason we use this model is we want to answer the question, can we eliminate malaria? Can we eradicate malaria using existing uh, resources. The model is somewhat complicated. It violates spread principle, but and we use data from Ethiopia. My collaborator, Dr. Mohamed Awal, is from there, so we collected data and use it. Uh, the point is, we just wanted to show what happened. So, so here we did a plot for uh, the prevalence of malaria in humans at equilibrium in the absence of larvicide. On the y-axis is the RS coverage, so uh, and on the x-axis is the bed net coverage. So you see, so white here and yellow and light red. This, this are good. So the prevalence is like 2% in the entire population. So we want to do, so if we only use the long lasting insecticidal nets, if 90% of the population will sleep under the net, we can eliminate malaria. Okay, we, we want this control window. But of course, it's not going to happen. 90% is too high. But we, if 70% can do that, but we combine with 30% coverage of RS, we are still within the control window. So we can realistically achieve elimination as long as there's no uh, larvicide. We can achieve elimination of malaria, but also uh, manage resistance, effectively manage resistance in this window where it's white. And this is the frequency of the resistant allele and the frequency of the, uh, in the female mosquito population and the sensitive mosquito population and the uh, male mosquito population. And this increases with increasing larvicide. Anyway, uh, yeah, so this is what we said here. If, uh, uh, we can, Long lasting insecticidal nets can lead to effective control and management of resistance if coverage is high enough, greater or equal to 90%. But the estimate from WHO is 40 to 80%. So I know we, we're not going to reach that. But we can achieve this if we combine long lasting insecticidal nets and IRS at moderate coverages. This is what our result shows. Okay, so that we, we have the there's effective control window within which we have a really great chance to eliminate malaria using existing resources. But the size of the effective control window is dependent on many factors associated with the fitness cost of resistance, um, including larvicide coverage, proportion of new adult mosquitoes that are female, level of dominance of the resistant allele in heterozygous. Heterozygous means the gene has two alleles. One is resistant, one is sensitive. So the level of dominance of R against uh, S is very important. The higher that dominance is, uh, the more, the, the lower the, or the, the, the more the probability of shrinking the control window. Okay, so biological method of control, I'll just skip to uh, basically to, to this. Here we're releasing, okay, so I'll just go straight to the sterile insect uh, technology. We're releasing male mosquitoes that are sterilized, okay, into the wild population, in the population with maximum abundance of adult female mosquitoes uh, so that they can mate. And when they mate with the adult female mosquitoes, the offsprings of the eggs laid by the adult female mosquitoes will not hatch. Okay, the, leg, the eggs laid will not hatch. That's the idea of the sterile. So we want to test, will this work in endemic areas? Can we achieve effective malaria control if our strategy is no longer insecticide-based intervention? It's no longer the use of drug therapy because of resistance to plasmodial, uh, plasmodial resistance to, to therapy and also anopheles resistance to pyrethroids and other insecticides. Can we use biological controls? So SIT is one way 
And this has been practiced in many different places. Actually, SIT has been applied not only in the context of malaria, but in the pest control in, in the 40s in the US and other places as well. And this has been tried and tested technology. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll go straight to the SIT. So sterilization is induced uh, through the effects of irradiation on the reproductive cells of the mosquitoes. So the female mosquitoes that mate with sterile male mosquitoes will produce no offspring, okay? Thereby reducing the next generation population of mosquitoes. So this is the way it works. So you are in this, uh, well, through this drone, okay, I know I have a few minutes, right? Maybe a few minutes. Maybe, maybe one minute. Okay, one minute, okay. <laughs> no problem. Anyway, this is the way it works, I, because it's important. To me. So we're releasing the sterile male mosquitoes that are, in this case, blue. These are sterile male mosquitoes, so mosquitoes that are genetically modified, okay? And green uh, 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 adult female mosquitoes that have not mated. So we want the blue to mate with green. But then the brown are male mosquitoes that are wild. They are not genetically modified. So we do not really want the brown to mate with green because if they do, then the green can lay eggs, okay? That will hatch. So what we really want is the blue to, match, to mate with the unmated females and produce purple. So those are purple, these are adult female mosquitoes that will never lay eggs or the eggs will never hatch. Okay, so under, after one generation, we see that most of the mosquitoes are purple. That's why the ones we want. There are sprinkles of green and mated females and also wild males that are. So that's the strategy, okay? So, and then they, those mosquitoes will lay eggs. If they are purple, the eggs will not hatch. So this is the dead end. But if it's green, the eggs will hatch and become larvae and poofy and then continue the process again. Does that make sense? Okay, and that's the equation. Okay, so we release the, this is the total number of male mosquitoes that are sterile, sterile. So if they mate with unmated females, okay, they, they will not, eggs will not hatch and that's it, that, and they move here. But if they mate with uh, wild males, okay, then the offspring, uh, the, the, the eggs laid will, will, will hatch and they move here and then they move over here and then produce poopy and then adult mosquitoes. And that's the way it works. It works. The poopy, okay, so a proportion after the pupal stage, a proportion become adult female mosquitoes that are females, and the remaining proportion one minus RMS. Anyway, so we, we showed this simulation that it works, but because of time, I have to, uh, have to skip, skip this. Uh, this is the female mosquitoes that have mated with sterile males. Those are the ones we want to survive at steady state. Okay, we do not want the female mosquitoes that have mated with the wild males because those will lay eggs that will continue to produce more mosquitoes. And this we have shown we run the simulation for the first two years to stabilize things, and then we release the mosquitoes after two years, uh, the sterile male mosquitoes, and we see a steady state, this guy's dominate the other ones, and that's the way we want, okay? Anyway, um, so in conclusion, the population abundance of mosquitoes, crucial to understanding what's going on with malaria. Uh, there's optimal temperature range within which we have maximum mosquito population. And also malaria intensity is about 28 to 30 degrees Celsius in most of sub-Saharan African countries, particularly in Western and uh, uh, Central Africa. Uh, there's a barcode by application which makes disease control more difficult uh, if disease induced mortality exceeds a certain threshold. And malaria burden in sub-Saharan Africa is shifting eastward and southward, okay, uh, based on the 2080 and 2030 International Panel for Climate Change emission, uh, greenhouse emission scenarios. Uh, there's this control window in LNIS stage within which, in parameter space within which insecticide-based intervention can lead to effective control of malaria, uh, while also effectively managing control uh, insecticide resistance. We can eradicate malaria using existing resources. I think this is what we are saying. As long as we are very careful in choosing the coverages of these resources optimally, okay, we can er eradicate malaria based on this. And with SIT, this is also promising particularly if we release large number of, so here we have to use impulsive differential equation system because the question is, when is the optimal time to release and how many do you have to release? Do you release weekly, monthly, yearly? And for how long do you have to do it? There are all logistical questions which we've been able to address using the model. Okay, so the, if we release large number of sterile mosquitoes for a one year period, like 100,000 for one year period in this area, in Cape Samoit area in Kenya, we could actually lead to elimination in that local area. But the final thing, this is the end of the uh, presentation. Uh, we need to pay attention to the big picture. Most of the diseases, most of the vector-borne diseases that we talked about, and also diseases that are really deadly for humanity, 
uh, human disease like Manchuria and plague, the 1918 pandemic of, uh, of uh, influ uh, flu uh, influenza. Uh, and the COVID right now, you know, like killing uh, millions of people around the world. They are mostly zoonotic. They are diseases that are initially circulating only in animal population. And then they start to circulate in both animal and human population. And then you have mutations that lead to forms that are transmissible between humans. But we are responsible for many of these diseases. They are all related, they are zoonosis. They are all related to human encroachment of the wildlife, okay? Through animal farming, through whatever it is, deforestation and so on that we do. So non-pharmaceutical interventions can be a stopgap measure to get ourselves out of COVID and so on, but it's only a matter of time before it comes back again, okay? As long as we continue doing what we're doing, that, that means uh, we are destabilizing the environment, okay? through deforestation, through agricultural purposes, through climate change and all of those things that humans do, as long as we're not careful in how we do those things, uh, until we control these things, deforestation, wildlife trade, concentrated animal farming, and climate change, unfortunately, history will continue to repeat itself. And I thank you for listening. Wow. Thank you so much, Prof. That was uh, fantastic. Yeah, but <laughs> that was I'm a Sorry, I took too long. I'm sorry. I took too it's long. okay. That was a lot of information. I know uh, people have questions, but um, the first question I would like to ask briefly is, um, as we know that we have um, a very high temperature in most uh, some areas in Africa. So I was just wondering, when we have the temperature up to like 30%, is it still possible to eradicate when we combine um, long-lasting insecticide and um, um, IRS? That's a very good question. Yes, yeah, so, so 30 degrees, yes, is quite common in many places, actually in Western Central Africa, 30 degrees is quite common, even long, uh, even higher than 30 degrees is, is, is common. Yes, yeah, so that's what we showed with the control window, with the effective control window, we can effectively control even at that temperature, because if, I didn't mention, of course, people are also getting treatment, right? So atomicity is available pretty much everywhere in the world right now. So um, maybe not at the same coverage level as uh, chloroquine and some other, but at least it's available. So we have really good drug therapy in many places. So I think elimination can still be achieved as long as the coverage for long lasting success and IRS is within that control window. So which is more, so we need a lot more people to sleep under bed. But unfortunately, in some places, not a lot of people like to sleep under bed. Somehow that's I, I remember growing up as a child in the endemic area myself. I, I was sleeping under a bed net. I didn't really like it. But, but if we can convince a lot of people to do that, yes, even at 30 degrees, I uh, mean uh, daily temperature, I mean monthly temperature, I think el 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 elimination can still be achieved. Okay. It's possible, yes. Very good point. Thank you. Um, Martin, do you want to ask a question now? Uh, yeah, I was just going back to your... Uh, Hardy Weinberg equations and the model you were looking at with resistance. I put it in the chat. I'm just, I'm assuming that the resistance mechanism you have within that model works on both pyrethroids and the insecticides used in, in IRS. So it's just assuming that it's a similar mechanism. Absolutely. Yes. Excellent question. That's true. Yes. And yeah, it was, it's a single uh, gene. It's, 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 uh, Single gene was two alleles and uh, random mating and the Heidi Weinberg, yes. And the mechanism is both for resistance to both the bed net, the pyrethroid, and also the other chemicals that are embedded in IRS. True. All of them, yes. That's that okay. assumption. Very good question, yeah. Uh, I, I, I've got one more question, but I think other people will want to turn. So, Jimmy, no, go, that's a... go ahead. You have the uh, floor. Come on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Um, uh, <laughs> What well, most of the talk, because it's been, I, I, I did a lot of this from my undergrad, but um, most of it's a long time. Uh, my, but most of the talks seem to be focusing on fel falciparum and eradication of falciparum. With yeah. the really long dormant stages in the liver with Vivax, does it make eradication more feasible, less feasible? Because that's kind of, I remember talks on this when I was an undergrad, and obviously that's, you know, going back more than 10 years now times have changed kind of thing and they kind of they felt at the time it was only just debating whether or not it was possible to eradicate malaria um but does it make a difference if you shift focus from falciparum to vivax 
Well, so the, the, the reason people focus on falciparum because it's what's happening in sub-Saharan Africa, right? Is the dominant. Yeah. So Biovax, of course, yeah, it's also extremely important. The two account for pretty much all the death, but Biovax tend to, 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 to tolerate cooler temperatures. So, so it's, it tend to be in more temperate areas uh, where the, the, the burden of malaria is not as high as it is in, uh, in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So that's really the focus. Because, but, but yeah, I agree totally, it should be both. It should be both Vivex and, and falciparum, definitely, to, to achieve. I just Go wondered ahead. if I wondered in terms of modeling it, the the dormant stage in the liver would possibly create make it make it more challenging in some respects. I, I think so. I haven't done the modeling at that uh, liver stage. I know some some other colleagues and collaborators have done that, but I haven't. I haven't. But I think yes, it will be because then you have to look at multi parasite, right? You have, it's not single parasite. It's not just falciparum. Now you have two parasites at least, Vivex yeah. and falciparum. I'm looking at their dynamics. Uh, I think I think the person who's done a lot of work on the in-host dynamics is um, uh, in, in in France. Um, I should not forget his name. Uh, okay, the name escapes me right now, but I'll try to remember and get back to you on that. But but I know that that's also yeah. I was just interested. Okay. Thank Excellent. you. Um, I can take one last question. Any question from anyone? Okay. They're all my friends. They don't want to ask me to. Sorry, no. Uh, Jimmy, I was trying to put my hand up and then I keep on realizing. Oh, I, did, I didn't see you. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Kong, how are you? I'm good, Professor Gomel. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you for the impressive talk, actually. Very impressive and timely. Um, I was When you gave the talk, I was looking at the temperature distribution. When you talk of the malaria shifting with temperature, and I was just wondering within myself whether will it be that it will shift or it will expand? Is it both? Ah, yeah, so from the plot, I wish I could show the plot back. But yeah, it's both. It, what we showed in this, uh, it, particularly for the Eastern African map, you will see the red is shifting and also expanding too. It's still in the old places, not as much in terms of abundance, but it's still there, but at a much lower, lower level. Does that, does that make sense what I'm trying to say? So, so if we're moving from, let's say, Central and Western Africa, we're not saying completely gone, that, that there's still incidents uh, of malaria in central and eastern, but not the same level as before, but we're shifting more towards. Uh, now we see more, we're going to be seeing more in southern and eastern Africa compared to western and central. But I think it's both shifting and it's fine. The, the biggest, uh, and, and, uh, the, the biggest uh, debate in, in, in ecology of malaria community is whether or not climate change will lead to a shift or expansion. And what we are saying in this industry, I think it's both. Is both shifting and expansion. That's at least what we're saying based on our initial data. But maybe more, 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 it, yeah, more research. Uh, uh, was, was, uh, more research is needed for this to really answer the question. But at least based on our simulation, Dr. Augusto is here. She's my collaborator. Okay, you should answer all the questions. He's the expert now. He did the climate change stuff a long time ago. Uh, what's the question? She's asking the question. I'm sorry, I wasn't asking a question. I just, I was apologizing for coming late. I thought the timing was central time. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, so, but yeah. Well, but well she, great. Yeah, so, so we did a lot of work on, on climate change. She and I actually and some others run the Nimbias uh, uh, working group on climate change and mosquito-borne diseases or vector-borne diseases. So she's, she's mm -hmm. one of the experts. So if you have any tough questions, she should answer them. Thank you. Um, Thank Jimmy, you. follow up. Is there room for a follow up just to find out whether, with that shifting, if you talk of shifting and expanding in that sense, it, does it mean there's an optimal temperature, which means that if it is too hot, the mosquitoes will not survive? Because if climate, okay. Oh, yeah, that's what it means. So if it's okay, too okay. cold, the mosquitoes will not survive. If it's too hot, they, so like in, right now in Toronto, in, in, in the middle of too cold, Canada, yeah. Yeah, you, you hardly see any mosquitoes. Even in Winnipeg, where we used to have a lot of mosquitoes, in this, in, well, we still have. Uh, uh, Culex mosquitoes for West Nile in the, in the summer, in the late spring, you won't see any right now. In the one, it's like minus 40 degrees Celsius when it's too, too cold. Uh, when it's too hot, also the same thing. So, so that's optimal temperature for mosquitoes to thrive. So, so it's typically from 18 to about 20, 28 degrees to about 30 degrees or something like that. Above that, we start uh, seeing a decline. So it's, it's it, it decline in the population abundance of mosquitoes, but also in uh, uh, in, and that correlates, the higher the mosquito population, of course, the higher the, 
uh, malaria cases and also mortality. So that's correlation between abundance and malaria intensity. Uh, but that's optimal temperature. So it goes from 15 to, that's also optimal precipitation. So we did a paper, uh, uh, one of the former students actually at York University, Dr. Abdul Razak, he was a student of Harkin Zoo. So Harkin Zoo, actually, I don't know if he's here, but he does a lot of really good work on, on um, tracking Culex mosquito population at York University. So he worked with PHAC and to make estimates on a weekly by weekly. So really a, a very good study that he does. But anyway, so for, for the Culex in, in the Peel region, I was actually going to mention that in the examples, but I didn't have time. Uh, we did this simulations for the Peel region in, in Ontario, where you guys live, uh, the Culex data, and, and we showed the correlation, the optimal temperature and also optimal precipitation level that will show maximum abundance of Culex mosquitoes, which again suggests one is the best time to, to, to intensify control strategies. So when do you have the, those entomologists running around uh, spraying, you know, that, that's the time when you have the maximum population of the mosquitoes and also, uh, so that certain temperature and also certain precipitation levels. Thank you so much, everyone. I know we still have questions, but unfortunately we have to finish. <laughs> I'm Thank free. you. Anybody has questions, any comments, especially from students? Uh, so we can follow up because- I'll follow up uh, with an email. I do okay. have a question about behavior. Yeah? Oh, ask me. I know. Ask me. I'll follow up with email. I'll send you an email. No, no, no. Let, let's talk. Maybe you can teach me something. Let's talk. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> they are closing, so follow. Oh, up they have to close. Oh, sorry. Okay. 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 Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, do you have? Can I follow up with my question, or you guys are ending? Ah, uh, so you uh, maybe you send an email. Okay. Yeah, I will send an email. Okay. Yeah, okay. that's okay with me. I'll send an email. Okay. And well, I really so want to say thank you for um, Professor. Gomer, thank you for coming. It's such an honor to have you here today. And uh, I really want to say thank you. And well, it's an, honor, it's an honor to be back home in, in Canada, <laughs> even though online, but it's an honor to meet with you all also. And thank you for the kind invitation. And it's an honor also to dedicate a lecture to our very good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Fred Brower. So um, I'm thank happy you. to do this. And um, that's uh, next, next week, there's a big uh, symposium at UBC in his honor. So February 2nd to March was his uh, 90th birthday. Uh, yes. I think <laughs> Leah Keshet is hosting that next week. Yeah, so I would encourage people to attend. Thank he was you. a great guy. All right, everyone, take care and see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye.